Okay, we're going to get started. Um, please feel free to keep getting food and getting settled. On behalf of SALDIF, I would like to welcome you to Animal Law Week. We have events, lunch talks going on every day this week, so please check out our Facebook page and Facebook events for more information on that. Um, they're all in this room, so you already know where to go. Um, there's also sign-in sheets going around, so you can get on our email list for more information, so feel free to sign up for that, too, if you're not already on our mailing list. Today, we're very excited to welcome Justin Goodman from the White Coat Waste Project, which is a nonpartisan organization that is working to reduce taxpayer funding for animal testing. Um, Justin is the vice president. He works specifically in advocacy and public policy and is going to talk to you more about his work and what White Coat Waste does generally. So please welcome Justin. Thank you. Everyone. Is this better? Can you hear me now? I realize that's a very outdated joke that most of you probably don't get. Uh, I'm not a lawyer. My brother is a lawyer, actually, and works a little bit with Chris from what I just learned. Um, works on animal law, but I'm not a lawyer. My background is in grassroots advocacy for animals. So I got my start when I was, I've been vegan for about 20 years, but when I was in grad school at the University of Connecticut, I discovered there was a monkey lab there that no one had known about, had been there for over a decade and was receiving taxpayer money. And uh, I kind of stumbled upon this information and thought I should do something about this. I didn't know what to do. I never really met an activist before. So kind of navigated my way through learning how to use federal databases, learning how to use the Freedom of, Inf Freedom of Information Act, um, organizing protests, doing media, all the things that are involved in a grassroots campaign. And fast forward two years from the beginning of that, we shut this place down. And I thought, that felt good and productive. And maybe there's a way I can do this, uh, do more of this somewhere. So I started reaching out to organizations and eventually landed a job as the, ended up being the director of all the animal testing campaigns at PETA for about a decade. And left there a year and a half ago to join White Coat Waste, uh, White Coat Waste Project, which is a startup uh, founded by Republican political strategists uh, who are animal people, uh, you know, animal rights people in their hearts, uh, in their lifestyles, um, but felt like there wasn't a home in the animal protection movement for them. Because when they looked around at the establishment groups, the establishment groups are, at least their reputation is, and some of their policies are, fairly liberal, left-leaning, trying to tax meat, ban things. And for about half of the population in the United States, those are not principles that really resonate with folks. If, you're more, if you believe in uh, free markets or uh, smaller government, you might not like the idea of taxing the things you eat or banning you from purchasing certain things. Um, so White Coat exists to fill that void. We have, we have 400,000 members and supporters across the US, all over the place, every congressional district. And it's people from all across, across the political spectrum who want to see a broad coalition that can actually get things done in Washington. And this issue that we work on, taxpayer-funded animal experimentation, is unique among animal issues because the government is the number one culprit of the problem. So what's nice about animal testing issues is that there is wide bipartisan support. The majority of the public opposes animal testing. And if you start asking questions in polls related to who should be paying for it, and how much we see dramatic increases in Republican opposition compared to Democratic opposition to animal testing. About five points difference across the board when you frame questions about uh, government spending and you paying for something rather than just on you know, whether something is moral or right or wrong. So why bipartisan support? And the truth is, and I know this from being on social media, it seems like most people think the biggest problem with animal testing is somehow cosmetics testing on animals. Uh, that is the thing that I think a lot of people think of when they think about animal testing, but the truth is in the United States, it's virtually not happening anymore. It's barely happening anywhere any, in the world anymore, except in China where the government forces companies to allow the government labs to test products before they go to market. But in the United States, there are not companies testing on animals anymore. So cosmetics testing isn't really the biggest problem. What is, is 
government-funded animal experimentation. About two-thirds of all animal testing in the United States is funded by the federal government. Uh, $2 of federal money for every $1 of private money. And that adds up, just at the NIH, to about $15 billion. And when you add in other agencies, we're talking about $20 billion of our money is going to pay for animal experiments that we don't know about, uh, are not especially productive, and I'll talk about that in a second, and that most people oppose. Harvard is not immune to this. There's been lots of controversies at Harvard over the last few years. Recently, we exposed that Harvard right here at the medical school is running what a Harvard press release calls a mouse fight club, where they breed aggressive mice and force them to fight one another. We're paying for this. And there's a couple examples I like to show of taxpayer-funded animal experiments that are a good metaphor for the whole problem. Let's see if this works. Shrimp on a treadmill. You paid for it. Fish on a treadmill. You paid for it. This is an amphibious fish called a mud skipper on a treadmill. And monkey on a treadmill. There's lots of treadmill examples, but again, the metaphor here, I probably don't have to explain to a bunch of Harvard Law students, is lots of work, lots of money, lots of time, not particularly productive. And we see this. this these aren't isolated. The foremost experts in the world on epidemiology, on public health, agree that this is an incredibly unproductive enterprise. Dr. Michael Bracken from Yale spoke at NIH last year when he got an award for his work, and his estimate is that 87.5% of all biomedical research is wasteful because it's totally unnecessary, duplicative, or poorly conducted. 87.5%. Particular to animal testing, the NIH's estimate is that 90% of drugs that work in animal tests fail in humans because they either are ineffective or they're actually harmful. So there's a staggering level of inefficiency, even if you believe that some animal testing is okay. As an enterprise, it's incredibly wasteful and inefficient. Other papers have come out recently showing that despite the government spending $20 billion a year on animal testing, it is actually much less productive than the private sector when it comes to producing breakthroughs that are actually helpful. Because as you know, a pharmaceutical company, biotech company, all the places that are around here in Cambridge, they have to worry about their shareholders and return on investment, whereas the government can keep throwing money at treadmill projects for decades and doesn't really have to answer to anybody. Well, until now, but they haven't had to. And just the statistic on here is that 85% of FDA-approved medical innovations are solely developed in the private sector, and the government is only contributing to 15% of innovation. So it's spending twice as much on animal testing and contributing only 15 out of 100% in terms of output. So this is a great bipartisan issue. You have something for people who care about animals. You have something for people who care about government waste. And it's a way to bring people together, and especially in this time of hyperpartisanship in Washington. Again, bipartisan support across the board for these type of things. And that's where we come in. We try to unite what we call the liberty lovers and the animal lovers to fight against this wasteful spending. Now, just a little tidbit about how I set this up is, number one, I'm not a lawyer. I work with a lot of lawyers. I'm not a lawyer. Number two, I tried to make this practical because lots of stuff we do is you know grassroots campaigning and lobbying which may not be relevant to everybody here but I tried to give some examples of things we creative things we have to do with our attorneys to get the job done so the three kind of areas we work in and you'll appreciate the acronym I hope is finding waste and abuse exposing waste and abuse and defunding it so we work all the way from the basic research investigative side of things to the media side of things to actually half of my job is lobbying in Congress, working with lawmakers, helping write legis legislation and lobbying to pass that legislation, which we've had actually quite a bit of success with during the Trump administration because of our center-right approach to this issue and being able to bring in lawmakers who traditionally have a 0% on the Humane Society scorecard, for example, and, use, and having them as our target audience, bringing new blood into the movement. 
So in terms of finding waste, I'll give you an example. There was this one paragraph summary on the FDA's website in December of 2016. And basically, you don't have to read the whole thing, you probably can't even if you wanted to from where you're sitting, is they were doing nicotine addiction experiments on baby monkeys. And the idea was that they want to figure out at what age they become addicted and at what level of nicotine so they can then create a de facto ban on certain levels of nicotine and tobacco products. So dictate to Philip Morris and everyone else, you can't make t cigarettes that have a certain level of tobacco in them to avoid people in their thinking becoming addicted. The problem is, of course, is this compensatory smoking. If people are getting cigarettes with less nicotine, they'll just smoke more cigarettes. So this is just stupid on its face. Never mind the fact that monkeys don't smoke and you're addicting a different species to nicotine. Uh, anyway, so this was all that was available. I went on the, the federal research database, nothing. No listing, all the search terms, primate, monkey, primates, nicotine, FDA, going back to 2014, not a single project shows up. So it's impossible to find out what they're doing specifically for how long and also what it's costing us and what we're getting out of it. Just nothing there. So, and we don't really consider ourselves an animal rights group. I like this headline, but be that as it may. Um, we filed a lawsuit against the FDA for refusing to give us those documents. They eventually turned them over, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but this is where my kind of expertise ends, and our FOIA and First Amendment attorneys begins, and he steps in, and we sued the FDA for access to those documents, including videos, records of animals dying, and other things they didn't want to hand over to us. So there's a lot of work in just getting basic details about some of this stuff before we can even try to stop it. Same thing when we went to Cleveland. There's three Veterans Affairs hospitals in the country that are doing excruciatingly painful experiments on dogs, Cleveland being one of them. We asked for the project proposals. They refused to give them to us. We had to sue. Same in Richmond. The VA doing experiments on dogs where they buy five-month-old puppies, inject their arteries with latex to cause a heart attack, and force them, on treadmills, force them to run on treadmills until they collapse. Uh, again, they refused to give us lots of that information. We had to sue them. So that's just the basics of you know, navigating what's out there. $20 billion is a lot of money. There's thousands and thousands of projects. There's about 100 million animals in labs in the United States. There's a lot of ground to cover. Certainly, we don't cover all of it, but we try to make headway and progress where we can. We also discovered, kind of in this investigative part of what we do, that Harvard and other Ivy League schools for years have been violating spending transparency laws. So the federal law says that if you get money from the government for any research at all from the NIH, animal or not, that whenever you put out a press release, you have to include the price tag. You have to say, we got this money from the NIH on this grant and this exact dollar amount was spent on this project. Harvard, Yale, across the Ivies, not a single press release that was released in the last several years by any of these universities have included that information. So we discovered that, we did an analysis of all these press releases, hundreds of them, and then we allied ourselves with Rand Paul, John McCain, Ron Johnson, Jeff Flake, and James Lankford, who are some of the most conservative members in the Senate, also some of the you know, fiscal hawks who are really concerned with waste uh, and release reports on waste. We released this report about these violations and they immediately asked for a federal audit of the extent of that problem. And that audit is ongoing. So again, that's just finding the waste to begin with. Then there's the whole you know, the part of our work that is exposing that to the public, making sure you know about what you're paying for and how you can stop it. So just getting back to the cosmetics issue, for example, cosmetics testing, cosmetics companies are not testing on animals anymore in the United States. It's not happening. You know who is? The federal government. The federal government is actually testing cosmetics ingredients on animals at your expense and boycotting cosmetics when you go to the store that are tested on animals is not going to help that problem. Again, it's a spending problem. It's not an issue of boycotting. So that's one of the things we exposed to these analyses. We did a report called Spending to Death looking at all the dog experimentation happening across the United States in uh, federal laboratories. About 10% of all animal testing is in federal labs. So we released a report showing where that was happening, how much it cost. Again, prompting Congress to take action, calling for audits of why it's so hard to find information about these projects, what they cost, 
Are they complying with the law and what we're getting out of it? Because again, even if people, and I'm sure there's people in here who believe that animal testing is a necessary evil, that's fine to believe that. I don't agree, but you're welcome to. We have to be getting something out of it that's beneficial to public health in order for it to be a viable investment of our tax dollars. And in most cases, that's not happening, or it's impossible to find out if it is. We discover violations in some of these laboratories at the Richmond VA, where they're doing these heart attack experiments. There was an experimenter who repeatedly botched surgeries on dogs, killing them before they could even start the experiment. This guy was banned from doing experiments on animals, but then through FOIA, we discovered he, after getting banned, was given a raise and a bonus and is still allowed to perform procedures on veterans. So this is someone, you know, we like to say that wasn't good enough for dogs, but they're letting him touch and perform procedures on vets after being banned for this sloppiness. This actually prompted federal legislation to cut all funding for the VA's dog experiments. And again, in terms of us working with our attorneys and working on issues that might be of particular interest to people in this room beyond just the animal issues, there's lots of First Amendment issues we have to deal with. So for example, in Richmond where all these abuses were happening, we tried to run this ad on city buses so that everyone in the city will know what's happening at their expense in their backyard. And the city's transit system refused to run the advertisement saying they have a blanket ban on political ads. This isn't a political ad. This is a public service announcement. There's nothing political about it. You can see it as a political issue, just like any social issue can be a political issue. But they have a very poorly defined and vague policy. So we sued them, and right now we're in court with them, uh, actually now wrangling over whether the transit authority is a government entity or not, because now they are trying to say they are not even a government entity, even though they are created by the government and run by the government. Um, so that's a First Amendment case. So we have FOIA issues we deal with a lot, just to get basic information about what's happening. And then we have these First Amendment cases that we have to deal with quite a bit, which is institutions that have nothing to do with the problem, for example, the Transit Authority, allying themselves with a problematic institution like the VA and deciding that they're going to obstruct our ability to get our message out. But of course, that's not something we are going to tolerate, so we're in court now about that. The most important piece of all of this is actually getting results, right? It's actually getting things done um, for animals, getting them out of labs. That's why we exist. So we work with lawmakers on legislation to restrict or completely cut funding. So this is a photo of Tea Party Freedom Caucus member Dave Bratt, um, who is leading the charge in the House of Representatives right now with a bill called the Puppers Act, the Preventing Unkind Procedures, Unkind and Painful Procedures and Experiments on a Respected Species. That's poppers. I didn't come up with that, but I love it. Um, so this bill right now has 67 co-sponsors, about two-thirds uh, two Democrat, one-third Republican. Just for some context, most animal bills in Congress have about 100 Democrats to every one Republican. So keeping a balance of about two-thirds to one-third is very good. It shows strong bipartisan, in the big scheme of things, strong bipartisan support for these efforts, which has been great. But beyond just really introducing bills, we also actually tried to get them passed into law. And uh, in one case with the VA, we didn't even have to pass legislation. And that's why, for us, legislation is a means to an end. Uh, I, my job is not to necessarily pass a bill. My job is to get legislation introduced as a tool in a broader toolbox to make these changes happen. And if and I'll just take a break from the slide for a moment. If you look at any of the major developments that have happened on animal testing, positive developments that have happened on animal testing in the last 10 to 20 years, not a single one of them involved passing a piece of legislation to ban something. It was all uh, grassroots campaigning. Certainly legislative efforts played a role, but nothing was banned. And the two great examples of that are the use of chimpanzees in experiments. The use of chimpanzees experiments now is essentially banned. It's prohibited to fund them now from the, on the federal level. But there was legislation for over a decade in Congress that never passed. But undercover investigations, grassroots campaigns, lobbying efforts, um, general media, you know, media advocacy, those are the things that actually brought the, the program to an end. 
Uh, it wasn't passing legislation. Another great example is so-called random source cat and dog dealers. So these are dealers who until recently would go to flea markets, they would answer free to a good home ads, and they would collect dogs and cats, ran random source, from anywhere they could get them, and then sell them to laboratories for experiments. And until very recently, this was not a common practice, but it still happened. Again, legislation dating back to, I mean, the earliest version of the bill I remember is 1986. So over 30 years, this bill was introduced over and over and over again, never passed. But eventually, the campaigning, the grassroots campaigning, the pressure led the NIH to just ban funding. So they didn't ban the practice, but they restricted funding, which essentially accomplishes the same thing, because no one else was going to fund these things. So those are two examples of major milestones, things that the movement worked on for decades, decades, many decades, 30, 40 years on each of those. And they eventually came to an end, not through passing legislation, but through, again, a diverse kind of patchwork of advocacy tools. The LAVA is a great example of this. This is one of the three VA facility, four VA facilities that were experimenting on dogs until last year. We got a protocol from them describing experiments that they had just approved where they were going to breed Dobermans, so Doberman dogs, they were going to breed them to have narcolepsy, the sleep disorder, where they would spontaneously fall over and go to sleep. Uh, they were going to inject these dogs with methamphetamines for many, many months every day, and then kill them and cut their brains out. And we got this information. We went to the lawmakers who represent this district in California, T Congressman Ted Lieu, who's actually a veteran, other people from the LA area, and they wrote to the VA in a, you know, a public letter basically asking him, what the hell are you thinking? This is not only stupid on its face, um, but there doesn't seem to be anything having come out of this, even though you've been breeding these dogs for 20 years. Within days, they announced that they were just canceling the project. They weren't going to pursue it. So again, and, you know, we didn't need to introduce a bill to stop that. Sometimes, as the saying goes, sunlight is the best disinfectant. We find that time and again. But that's why the, the open records work, the, you know, the basic research we do is important, but also this FOIA work we do is so important because we would not have the information we need, the basic information about these projects to know what they're doing, know what, how they're trying to justify it, know who's paying for it, and know where the, you know, the money is coming from and how much. Um, so getting to this point requires quite a bit of work, but sometimes this was literally one news story. This is the second of two. The first one was in the LA Times about the letter. The second one was a few days later about LAVA saying they're not going to do the project. Right? Back to the dog issue, we actually did pass legislation this past year. There was a one-year defund version of the Puppers Act that would cut funding for the most painful experiments on dogs at the VA. And that was a bill that passed unanimously in the House of Representatives last July by a voice vote. So that means it was yes, all members of Congress were a yes on this bill in the House. This is now being considered by the Senate. But what this does, even if this bill never makes it to the president's desk, is it sends a signal to Congress. It sends a signal to the VA. It sends a signal to other agencies that there is strong bipartisan support for this effort. And even if they don't pass the bill, there's 400 plus members of Congress who are going to hold the VA accountable for this one way or another. So other ways we kind of rally support for this is this passed already. We're waiting to see what happens in the Senate, which could be the next few weeks. We just continue adding co-sponsors to that standalone bill, the Puppers Act, because that shows this list of members. Right now there's 67. A big list of bipartisan members who oppose a certain thing. Right? And then you get those people to sign other letters. You get them to give, give quotes in the media. And they create this climate where it becomes very difficult for an agency to justify continuing to do something, or really just to take the heat. I don't know if people follow scandals with the VA, but the VA is, for many years has been just completely scandal ridden from you know, falsifying wait lists to make it look like veterans aren't waiting as long for their health care. Most recently, the secretary of the VA, David Shulkin, took a trip to, Wimble to England and got free tickets to Wimbledon and the taxpayers paid for his wife to fly first class. There's lots of other scandals they need to deal with. So if they can do a good thing for animals and you know, make a, get a good PR hit, they're often willing to do that. And that's kind of what's happening with the VA right now is that they have so many other problems to deal with that they basically just get fatigued because I could work on this 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. That's what White Coat does. They can't, they need to worry about 10 other things. So if you just keep wrapping up the pressure and show this is growing and not going away, 
that's a way to get them to basically end up saying mercy. And it's working with the VA. Obviously, LA unilaterally decided it was going to stop. House passed this bill to cut all the funding for the most painful categories of dog testing at the VA. And we had this other example that I told you about the FDA monkeys. So basically, we sued. We got some of the records. Once we got that first batch of records, we called Jane Goodall and told her what was going on. She immediately wrote a letter to the commissioner of the FDA. And within two weeks, he announced he was suspending the project and was considering sending all the monkeys to a sanctuary. This was like, I've never seen a response like that before in terms of how quickly it happened and how decisive it was. That was in uh, September. That was in September. In our, the course of our lawsuit, it's going on. They decide we're, they're going to lose the lawsuit. They're going to give us every piece of information they had, including videos, including documents. They sent us those overnight. And before they even hit our mailbox, the FDA released a press release saying, you're, basically, you're going to see these videos. We've decided before these get out that this is completely canceled. We're sending th all 30 money monkeys to a sanctuary and are doing a wholesale review of animal testing across the agency. And again, that had nothing to do with legislation. It had to do with some damning information that they didn't want people to see. It had to do with getting a high-profile figure like Jane Goodall. And we also had very conservative members of Congress weighing in just on the stupidity of the project that they were upset it was happening in the first place. And again, that creates this climate we need to create. Because all of this is a choice. None of this testing, very little testing in the United States is mandated. Most of it is voluntary. So what these government agencies are doing, all voluntary. Most of what the universities are doing, the Mouse Fight Club here at Harvard, it's all voluntary. So we don't need to ban it because no one is forced to do it in the first place. What we need to do is just cut off the source of the problem. I spent many years fighting projects after they've received the funding. Like Harvard's Fight Club is a great example of this. It's been getting funded for years, gets hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Those ca that money has already been he sent here. Those checks are already cashed. And it's going to be hard to convince someone who makes a healthy living off that when the checks keep coming in and they get rubber stamped every year to not do it anymore. So that's why it's not a uh, demand side problem. It's a supply side problem. We need to look at what the source of the problem is. And, it's, that's the, and the source of the problem is, is the government does not have to worry about return on investment. It doesn't have to be accountable to taxpayers when it comes to this issue. At least it hasn't been. So the problem is self-perpetuating. The people getting the money are happy. The universities are happy. They get 40% right off the top of every grant. So if you get a $100,000 grant, $40,000 is just administrative costs, keeping the lights on, paying for your assistant, paying for supplies. It is a gravy train. It is a huge money maker, $20 billion a year. And universities rely on that money for lots of different things. So you're not going to convince Harvard that they shouldn't take money from House Fight Club. But you can convince lawmakers that they shouldn't write that check in the first place because it's not in their interest, it's not in taxpayers' interests, uh, it's certainly not in animals' interests. So the FDA was the most recent and big victory that we had. And again, that was a result of FOIA work, of uh, coalition building with Jane Goodall, and actually lots of pro, this might interest people, pro-vaping consumer advocacy groups. There's a big interest in the vaping community right now about uh, restrictions on vape because it's kind of a new area of medicine and law. Um, people are concerned that there's going to be restrictions on vaping that prevent people from switching to e-cigarettes and vape from tobacco because the restrictions are going to be so stringent on producing and marketing those products. And there is evidence that people will quit smoking if they use them and they're less harmful. So there's this clash right now with the FDA not looking like it's giving the green light for a new smoking apparatus but a lot of pressure from consumer advocacy groups and pro-vaping groups that um, it should be just as easy, if not easier, for people to buy vaping products. Anyway, they saw this whole FDA thing as an attack on smoking and vapors because of what its intent was, which was to ban certain levels of nicotine in products. So we had this coalition letter that went out from groups that have never said anything about animals before, basically saying this is bad science and you're it's wrong to base a public health policy that will affect tens of millions of Americans based on monkey experiments that are not going to translate. Um, so again, it's about, you know, we need to widen the tent of animal protection. And if we only, can, or, you know, if we're only can, including animal rights people or people who are comfortable uh, banning things and taxing everything, like, you know, every week I see a new op-ed about taxing meat 
And that's fine, I think, in principle. That's, you know, maybe that's the way to solve the problem. But there's a lot of people who, number one, eat meat, don't want it to be more expensive. Uh, number two, don't think we need to tax anything anymore. Um, and there's other ways, in a lot of cases, to solve these problems, right? So that's why the title of this is Don't Ban Animal Testing, Defund It, Cut the Money. If we cut money, federal funding for animal testing right now, two-thirds of it would be wiped out. If 10% of it, if 5% of it, if 1% of it got wiped out, that would be a huge victory. If we're talking about a million animals in labs, if we got cut 1%, that's a million animals we save. That's huge. That's huge progress. It's good for animals. It's good for everybody. So if we can look at this problem more holistically, instead of after go <clears throat> going after one lab, after it's already received its money, and say, how do we get lawmakers to understand this is a bad investment? And not only is it a bad investment, it will, they will be held accountable for it in the future. So... You know, the idea here is to build a movement where members, and we also, White Coat, the founders and executives of White Coat, including me, have also started a, a PAC, which is a separate organization, to be involved in politics. Because these people need to know that they'll be held accountable if they keep approving and upping the budget of these agencies willy-nilly without holding them accountable for what they're doing to animals. When you have our most recent poll on the VA dog testing, for example, 66% of people overall support cutting funding for dog testing at the VA. 71% of Republicans and 64% of Democrats. That is huge bipartisan supermajority level support that you see very little on any social issue, right? The biggest social issues of our day, maybe medical marijuana is the exception to that. But otherwise, there's huge bipartisan support for these issues and I think we haven't done enough to harness that support, that growing support, that growing support and make political change. Um, so that's kind of what we focus on, again, is educating lawmakers, educating taxpayers, and then bringing everyone together, uh, hopefully to move the issue forward a little bit. Um, so that's what we're up to. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. We, again, we try to use, again, from va pro-vaping people to Jane Goodall to party members, Ted Lieu, who's famous on Twitter for attacking Donald Trump. Trump. There we go. We try to bring everyone into this and make it welcome for everyone. So it doesn't seem like a liberal thing or a conservative thing. It's a very wide tent organization and mission that we have. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So from what I've understood, there seems to be a lot of support for the idea of defunding animal testing in general. What I fail to comprehend a little bit, well, although I do appreciate the law being done for that is, why would there, presumably, the reason why you're focusing on that is because there's not a correspondent degree of support for, for banning animal testing across the board or even in, in uh, stages. If there is such a discrepancy, and I'm terribly ignorant about that, why would that be? Just so I understand the political dynamics. So actually, the biomedical lobby is one of the most powerful in Washington. I don't know why this isn't cooperating. Harvard is a member of lots of different coalitions and trade organizations that lobby for more spending on animal testing and biomedical research generally. Um, and basically every university is a member of that. They, they, they invest, they not only invest money. Thank you. That's a fake pocket. The problem is, is that the people who support animal testing, Harvard or anyone else, they have a PR problem, right? You can only say so much about your animal research program until start, people start asking more detailed questions. Well, what do you mean by that? What animals are you talking about? What do you do to them? How much does it cost? They don't want to say too much. So we're dealing with a situation right now in the state of Virginia, which the VA, the, so the VA's largest testing, dog testing lab is in Richmond. So Republicans in the state of Virginia introduced a bill to cut funding for those projects because it was getting some state money. The VA, who it, basically the bill was designed to target them, they did not show up once to any committee hearing to testify about anything. They did not say peep to any member of the House of Delegates or the Senate in the state of Virginia because they don't want to be the person standing up here defending giving puppies heart attacks, right? So they have a, there's a bit of a predicament. Politically, they're powerful and they have a lot of money, but that's not everything. I mean, in Washington, it's a lot, but it's not everything. So again, 
the work of exposing and really hammering home what these places are doing and that it's with your money uh, is able to, you know, again, these are people who are not against animal testing. The lawmakers we work with are not just, they're not like fringe people who are, you know, <coughs> don't mow their grass and, uh, you know, that's not the type of people they are. These are meat eating, hunting, uh, whatever, you know, go, they probably go to the circus and don't think about it. Like people like that are supporting this effort because there's certain abuses that in 2018 everyone can agree should not be happening, including putting puppies on treadmills and giving them heart attacks. Um, so yes, their lobby is very powerful. We have been able to get things done because they don't understand how to react to this. They can't frame it as a liberal anti-science thing because White Coat Waste has a policy, if you go on our website, we are not anti-animal testing. That's not our mission, that's not our objective, that's not our principle. We say we are against taxpayer-funded animal testing. We feel like the private sector is gonna be a much better judge of what is a good investment and what is prudent. And we can wipe out two thirds of the problem by focusing on what taxpayers are forced to be paid for, to forced to pay for. And again, it's like uh, you know the, the founder of White Coat worked in GOP politics for 15 years on campaigns, very controversial campaigns like anti Obamacare and defund Planned Parenthood type of campaigns, right? And again, whatever your personal opinions are about those particular issues, the idea behind both of those is that it's you know they're both socialized medicine. They're socialized programs that even if you're, you know, there's people who are pro-choice who don't want to pay for how they see it, someone else's abortion, right? So that's why there's people across the political spectrum who've supported some of that stuff. The same idea is here. You don't have to be against all animal testing. You just have to be against you being forced to pay for it with no say, right? But it would seem, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. It would seem that there would be, there would be calls for the, the dynamics necessary to, to affect the change or to affect the bad I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. I apologize. No, there, there's, there, seems, there seems to be a case for, um, for the same law that you're talking about to work as aggressively towards uh, groups like yourself that work towards defunding these yeah. things uh, as it would be towards a hypothetical group that works for banning animal testing, taxpayer funded animal testing altogether. And oh, I'm banning animal testing altogether versus us. Yeah, yeah. So a group that was doing the same thing we do, but across the board ban type of thing. Yeah. Because House and Senate and the White House are run by Republicans who don't want to ban anything. They want to decrease regulations. And no matter what the political climate is, there's always going to be about half of lawmakers in Washington who don't want to ban things and don't want to create new regulations. Democrats do not have a problem with defunding things that they don't like, right? Like if. You know, there's lots of people we have who, on any animal-related scorecard, have 100%. They've always done the right thing across the board anytime an issue comes up. They're going to support this issue no matter what because they're kind of a true believer in the issue. And they actually like when it's framed and presented as something that can bring in people in the center and the right to make it more bipartisan. Um, I think we're also in a very unique political time in D.C. right now where there's, you know, I... I can't say what it would be like doing this another, at another time, but there is absolutely an appetite right now. You know, like our Twitter feed is filled with hashtag MAGA, hashtag drain the swamp, hashtag lock her up people who are not, you know, these aren't like PETA Humane Society people. These are people who are new to the movement who feel like, oh, white coat is my home. Like these people, I agree with them on the animal stuff. I agree with them on their particular way they approach it from a free market, small government approach. Those group, those people, and there's thousands, hundreds, and millions of them. They don't necessarily relate to the big groups, so they're not necessarily willing to put their their it's political framing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and we don't it, we don't frame this in in a in a dishonest way. This is genuinely, I think, this problem can be solved by a smaller government free market approach, saying let the private sector figure out what's worth it. Let's stop throwing money at things that across the board everyone says is about ninety percent of it is useless. Um, that's not something that's going to resonate with everybody. Um, so yeah. So we already have. Yeah, 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 yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Sorry, I didn't understand. No, Wait, no. Yeah, yeah. Um, so thanks a lot for coming. This is uh, 
I didn't know any of this. Uh, and so among the things I don't know is, uh, so when, uh, I don't totally understand how grant and funding of various experiments, like at what point each decision is being made. Sure. So I guess uh, I'm trying to, and this kind of dovetails with what was just being discussed, but so when the uh, VA is defunded, or, or a particular experiment is defunded, that results in like the VA having overall less money, right? No, because, <clears throat> not necessarily, because we approach it as a, these, these are spending problems, not funding problems, right? So the VA and the NIHC's agencies have more money than they, they know what to do with. That's part of the problem. Um, we're not saying you should cut their budgets. We're saying that don't spend it on this, a thing that's inefficient and most people oppose. All right, they can spend it on other research. They can spend it on things that will be more productive for public health and for taxpayers and for veterans in the case of the VA. And that's why we have such big support from veterans groups. There's 13 national veterans groups, including one of the largest ones that represents 250,000 vets supporting the campaign because they can't get a doctor's appointment. They've got to wait nine months to get a doctor's appointment. Vets are having their feet cut off by doctors who don't even have a medical license. So just crazy stuff is happening at the VA. Basic care and services aren't being provided, yet they're spending money on this, which has pissed a lot of people off. And actually on Friday, the secretary of the VA, who has been one of the most vocal opponents of our campaign, he had a USA Today op-ed last year slamming us and calling us extremists. He was on television last week saying he is no longer a strong supporter of canine research after reviewing all the evidence. So we have the cabinet secretary who has flipped on this and is now on the right side of us. We have people in the White House who are big supporters of the campaign. Um, so again, yeah, you don't have to... I'm all, every, most everyone cares about dogs, so that makes it a little easier. Um, but yeah, we're not attacking funding. And that's actually been, that's a good point, because with veterans groups, that was a big concern when we try to create this coalition with them. Is they're like, no, we don't want less money for veterans, we want more money for veterans. So we had to explain we're not, that's, that's not our fight. We think you should have more money. It's that the money you have right now, you don't have, you know, it's being used inefficiently. Um, which has been great, because the biggest obstacle to this was Criticizing veterans or doing something that hurts veterans could be the single most politically unpopular thing you can do, period, as an advocacy group or as a lawmaker. So it was critical for us to get veterans groups on board. Um, so when they understood that this is actually hurting them and not getting results, um, again, it's, everything we do is about widening the tent. So we try to you know, look at every issue from every perspective and see how can we talk about this in a way that's going to win the most supporters. Um, which is different. Other groups just like to, you know, kind of throw the stuff out there and be shocking and, that, and, and, and hope that the shock value changes how people think and feel and what they do and what they buy and what they eat. And that's fine. There's a, certainly a component of that in what we do also. Um, but we're really trying to grow the movement because I think for all the people who care about animals in the United States, to be totally honest, we've gotten very little done on the federal level in terms of laws that actually help animals or, or you know, protect them from wasteful government spending on government programs. So there's been very little done considering, you know, we have more supporters than the NRA does when you, when you really look at the movement broadly. We've got plenty of money. So those aren't the issues. It's the issue of just building the move, really building a movement. Um, and listen, we're not liked by everyone. There's certainly plenty of people in the movement who don't like that we're like, we worked with Roger Stone on this VA thing. Roger Stone wrote an op-ed in the Daily Caller telling, uh, Donald Trump, he better stop this. And he had us on InfoWars. We were on InfoWars with Roger Stone, which you don't, some of you might not know. InfoWars is like further right than Breitbart, further right than most any other publication, really. Um, but they have millions and millions of viewers who are like fired up about this now. And we want to welcome everybody. If you care about testing on dogs, then come to us. You know, we're not, there's, and also the fact that we're a single issue organization helps that. You don't have to like, you know, if you work with them, if you're supporting a bigger group, you might not agree with their whole agenda. And if you look at things like criminal justice reform, things like mar mar marijuana reform, things like marriage reform, all of those were basically advocated by and won by groups that had a very narrow focus. So you don't get into, well, I support you, this group on this issue, but not on this issue. We only work on one thing. Oh, sorry, I don't know. Sorry. Oh, um I'm not in charge. So. <laughs> um, thank you. This, I think it's really important to try and find bipartisan support for this kind, these kinds of issues. I'm wondering if within that you ever find a tension between 
you know, you, you mentioned a lot of these um, experiments are kind of obfuscated. Once you do find out kind of what is the purpose of some of these animal testing, whether there is a tension between the wasteful versus, you know, what if you get a, your FOIA back and it's, you know, this addiction study is supposedly supposed to be helpful. Like, how do you kind of navigate that tension and do you just try to stick with cases that are, you know, Agreed. wasteful on their face? Um, and is there a movement to try and maybe expand the different definition of wasteful in the context of animal yeah. testing? That's a great question. So obviously, yeah. I mean, if you think about what I highlighted, nicotine addiction on monkeys, dogs being given, puppies being given heart attacks and animals on treadmills. Yeah, on their face, most people are going to say, yeah, that's, I don't support that. Um, that said, though, if you look you know, across the board, when you look at the statistics and you see these failure rates are, you know, inefficiency and failure rates 90, 95% higher in some disease areas, um, it's actually hard not to pick a project that's not stupid and wasteful. Um, there's no shortage of them. But again, our point is, you know, if we, if we were doing an interview right now, my, our point is, is that let the private sector make that decision because they're going to have to worry about how much money is spent, what the political uh, backlash is going to be for doing that, and if it gets results. Whereas there's no incentive to innovate or actually find cures within this government funding system because the longer you can prolong your project, the longer you get paid to just walk the treadmill, right? So there's not an incentive with government agencies to actually innovate, actually find things that are helpful. It's lots of tinkering for as long as you possibly can until you retire, and then that's it. So there was a project a few years ago that I stopped at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and they literally wrote in their approved project proposal at the university that we need to use, I forget how many cats it was. They were doing brain experiments on cats. We need to use 30 cats a year because this way we can keep our productive publication record up and keep getting funding from the NIH. Like That was their justification for doing it. It wasn't we're going to cure deafness or something. It was we need to keep the money coming. And as soon as that got in the media, of course, they went back and amended the project, and that didn't say that anymore. Um, but that was like a rare moment of truth and clarity in one of these projects. And I think if everyone was truthful, they'd probably, they'd probably say that in most project proposals. Um, so yeah, there might be things that have potential to do something good. Those are going to be the exceptions, not the rule. And let the pharmaceutical and biotech and like philanthropists are spending billions and billions and billions of dollars a year now on biomedical research. Um, again, there's no shortage of money. Like, there's plenty of rich people and rich companies and rich organizations in the United States. Um, let them figure out a way to fund it. Yeah. Okay. Unfortunately, so we're running out of time. We've got a class in right after. But hopefully, if, if the, you could, I'm yeah. sorry, we have to get out for class. Oh, we have to get out now. Yeah. Okay. Um, but if you could stick around for a few minutes, maybe if there are any lingering questions. Yeah, and then That'd just, I never went to this slide, but if you go to prisonersofwaste.org, that's where you can write Congress about the VA issue, but also you do that and then you'll be on our mailing list and can see other things that we're up to. If you could join me in thanking Justin for coming out today. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Um, and we'll be back in here tomorrow and the rest of the week. Um, and please make sure to sign up on our sign-up list that's going around if you have not already. Thank you guys so much.